Good morning. Welcome to To The Point. This week, President Trump continued his first overseas trip. His first budget recommendation was sent to Congress. And by the way, it is just a recommendation. They'll be talking about that all the way through the summer and likely into the fall. In Lansing, they're still talking about the budget. But something happened earlier this year, and that's the focus of this week's show. We sat down with Senator John Prose to talk about a group of bills that may impact more people than you think when it comes to criminal justice reform. Senator, let's talk about something that I've heard talked about in this building since I've been covering. It's called criminal justice reform. And it means something different mm -hmm. to a lot of different people. I know you've been instrumental in working on this. And I look at this from three standpoints, and you can correct me where I'm wrong, but there is uh, certainly a fairness issue. There is certainly a moral issue that goes along with this. And there's a big economic issue that goes along. Let's start with what our criminal justice system, just corrections alone, cost us in this state. That's a big line. I'd Rick, you asked the first question about criminal justice reform and what corrections means. Corrections is only a portion of what this discussion is on criminal justice reform. And that's really what, what I sought to do with my Senate and House colleagues was to remind them that criminal justice reform is not just the $2 billion that we spend as a state within our prison walls, just within those 42,000 people that we have within the prison walls. What we're talking about is that entire timeline. And that timeline starts first and foremost with our youngest of offenders that are committing crimes. Truancy is often a way into that particular life of crime. Uh, they're, they're not in school, they're not being active in school. So our youngest offenders in the criminal justice space then become our older adult offenders in our probation side of the equation. And of course, probation is pre-prison. Oftentimes it takes a series of felony convictions before we ever see somebody that's actually convicted that goes to prison. And then after prison, we talk about parole and success in parole, success in the areas of, the, of preparation for parole. Uh, and the reality is, is that when we looked at the numbers in the state of Michigan, we recognized that on probation and parole, that we had on an annual basis the commitments to prison, 50% of the new commitments to prison were failures on probation and parole. So take that entire timeline criminal justice reform is not just the prison walls. It's also probation, parole, and our JJ, juvenile justice side of the equation. So what we did is we put into place uh, some best practices, a series of bills that are tested in other states. We looked at a way to try to incentivize the department to find those best practices that are evidence-based to implement for better success on probation and parole. And then ultimately in the process, we see fixed lives, less crime in our communities. Uh, and we, it's not too long ago, we, we were leading the nation with three of the most dangerous cities per capita for violent crime in the nation. We recognize that that is still a challenge for us in Michigan. We have a high crime rate. While it's dropping, we still have a high crime rate. So it's important for us to look at it in a very broad fashion. And the legislature did that this first quarter. Well, let's talk about some of those specifics because one of the things, and it depends on who you ask, it's, it's very much um, if you talk about changing the tax code and if you talk to certain people, they'll say, well, that means cutting the cost of taxes. And others will say that means making taxes more fair and making sure that the little guy is not paying as much. So criminal justice reform has the same kind of variables because some people would say that means shorter prison systems, uh, uh, sentences. And you might say it means starting very early on trying to keep people out. So what are some of the specifics with this? Bill? So what we did is we, we recognize that there are multiple facets to it. Uh, the first and foremost is, is we wanted to see a reduction in crime and and because we know that recidivism which is the failures under supervision uh, that we recognize that that we needed to do a better job under supervision and by under supervision we mean between probation prison and parole in those three phases we have a hundred thousand Michigan citizens under supervision today we know who they are we know where they live we know the kind of crimes that they're committing we know the kind of underlying problems that they have whether it be drug alcohol or mental health issues so what are we doing to address those particular areas? And that's where we expanded some more of our, our courts that, that are problem solving courts, trying to get to the underlying problems that exist. And our judiciary is doing amazing work in actually becoming counselors on the bench. They're not just simply hammering the gavel uh, and sending people to prison or sending them to probation or to jail. Instead, what they're beginning to do, and this is kudos to, to the state court administrative office, and all of our judges, they're beginning to look at those best practices and utilize our swift and sure sanction court. We institute in these bills 
On the back door, meaning the probation side of it, we do a probation certain sanction, which is similar to what you have on Swift and Sure, which is probation. So we do it on parole side. Uh, the idea is, is let's make sure that we give these offenders the best kind of tools to be successful. If they're successful, they're not committing crimes in our communities, which means fewer victims. The underlying benefit of all of this, without question, begins first and foremost with fewer victims, and that is an untold cost to the victims and their families. It means safer communities, which means what? It means more productive communities, and then ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're fixing the underlying problems of some of these offenders, it's not soft on crime, but instead what you're saying is, let's solve those problems underneath the system here that's, that's causing the problems, and then ultimately what do we do? We end up saving money, and that's a big debate in Lansing today is, how much can we save as we see the prison population decrease? Well, as you accurately point out, the cost goes far beyond the $2 billion in corrections, but that $2 billion in corrections is a significant chunk out of what we think of as what is spent on all government, that's the general fund. I mean, yes. that pays for most of everything everybody sees as a government. This current fiscal year, about $10 billion, so that's 20% of it going for corrections, and that's just the incarceration part alone. So there is significant money to be saved. There is, and in fact, when we asked all of the different departments of, 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 of local government, of county government, and state government, we tried to aggregate what is the total cost what is criminal justice in its entirety in the state of Michigan? How much does that look like? The best that we could come up with by talking to our counties and talking to our sheriffs and our local PDs and our jails, $5.6 billion we spend on an annual basis, annually, in the state of Michigan. That's local resources, county resources, and our own state resources. So we recognize that any change towards best practices and evidence-based practices gives us the confidence that we're making good decisions and it gives us the confidence that we're actually offloading crime towards a benefit to the community overall. The bottom line is a better fiscal picture for all of the state of Michigan too. I don't know how much this set of bills, 18 bills? 18 bills, 18 yes. 18 bills is pretty comprehensive, so it touches a lot. And I don't know if it dealt with this, but there was a move in the 1980s and it permeated the entire country. It was about the truth in sentencing. Yes. And you said something a moment ago that made me think about this. People then wanted people sentenced for a determinate period of time and to serve that period of time. If I'm sentenced for 13 years, I don't get out in three. There was a big hue and cry and people were like, lock them up, throw away the key. Not judging if that was the right thing or wrong thing to do, we can judge it was a very expensive thing to do. There has been conversation since mm -hmm. then, and I don't know if this group of bills necessarily deals with it, but there was conversation in this town 10 years ago about sentencing guidelines and changing those. And the thing you said that made me think of it is you said not soft on crime, but trying to fix a system, a system not just for the people who may have been offended, but those offenders so they don't continue to be offenders. Does this in any way deal with criminal guidelines, sent sentencing guidelines? In the last decade or so, and I've been in the legislature a while now, I've seen a lot of these bills come through where we have three strikes in your outlaw, for example. Uh, that particular three strikes legislation has already passed and we've amended that. Uh, but truth in sentencing is something that we have to remember what the purpose of that is. The purpose of that is, is to ensure that offenders, as you pointed out, are held in incarceration if that's what the judge determines after a jury of their peers or in a plea arrangement with the, the prosecuting attorney in that particular jurisdiction determines that that's what's best for that particular community. Because remember, it's the people versus, right? So we recognize that, that, that those particular individuals are probably best to be in for a period of time. So that, as you said, if it's 13 years for Rick Albin, then in fact it's 13 years and not three and a half years, and then you're in the grocery store with your victims. So it really is about victims and making sure that the victims recognize. And it, it also adds to the credibility of the criminal justice system overall that we say something, we mean something. So we don't talk about changing sentences necessarily or going towards a good time sort of scenario. But what we recognize though is, is that we need to be working within the prison walls and within probation and parole to the kind of programming that helps to fix the underlying problems over, overall. What do we do to ensure that those individuals have the kind of job skills training? You know, Director Washington of the Department of Corrections has put in place an innovative nation-leading program as it relates to a, a vocational village. The idea being that those individuals inside our prison walls today who are eligible for the program, who are willing to do a full days of coursework 
within the prison walls can be trained in the skill that's necessary in the community that they're going back to. We like the program so much, we said, Director Washington, let's fund another one. We have two vocational villages that are now up and running with a couple of hundred offenders, prisoners in prison today, that will hopefully have the kind of job skills that will connect directly to a job when they get out on parole. And here's the key. Of the 42,000 we currently have in prison, and it's dropping significantly every month, because we're doing really a very good job on stopping the revolving door, 40,000 will be out within the next four years. So in other words, 90 plus percent of those in prison today are gonna to come back to the communities that they come from after having served their time. So we ought to make sure they're as prepared as possible and ready to be productive citizens in society again, both on parole supervision and then when they're released from parole then also back into the community without that kind of supervision. Give that underlying success a chance to really work and to grow and we'll be in a better position overall. Well, let's talk about that. There's something that is happening in the state that may facilitate that. And we don't know exactly where the economy goes, but we know that there are help wanted signs everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. How difficult is it, but how important is it to get people out of incarceration into employment to stop that cycle? And you talked about the recidivism earlier. How important is it to make sure that they have something to do and that they do it once they're out of prison? The most important thing that can happen on parole or even on probation for those high risk offenders that that may in fact be in the cycle of crime that continues to cause problems in our communities, that continues to have a, 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 just a raft of victims that are left behind because of it. The key to that is, is to make sure that there is the job skills, the soft skills, and the kind of training necessary to meet the job needs that exist in the communities today. My Southwest Michigan communities, there isn't a business, in particular in manufacturing, that doesn't have a help wanted sign up today. But my employers will also tell me that they are concerned about whether or not those individuals that come to the door are clean, first off, no drugs, uh, and secondly, that they show up on time and show up on time every day that they're expected. And oftentimes that's, that's the hindrance. Those two areas become really, so soft skills and drug and alcohol problems. Fixing those is gonna help without question. And then second to that is, is recognizing too that our businesses need to take some risk on these returning offenders. And that's where, where um, Senate Bill 14, uh, Senator Jack Brandenburg was the sponsor of that bill, chairman of the Finance Committee in the Senate with me. I serve on that committee also, which is our tax committee. And he recognized as a business owner, maybe we need to give a kickstart to those businesses and those business owners to take a risk on an offender. Uh, and that's exactly what the bill does. It's still in the House of Representatives. I'm hopeful that that's the 19th bill in the package that gets signed. Uh, I know that, that um, the new speaker is just doing a marvelous job. Speaker Leonard uh, was all in. Um, we've had a lot of really good support from the House of Representatives as we try to work cooperatively together on smart legislation that puts Michigan at the forefront nationwide in criminal justice reform. Before we leave this subject, mm -hmm. because there are a number of other things I want to talk to you about, but before we leave this, you talked about that cooperation and you talked about the importance of these bills. What is the best part? Just seeing that you can get 18 bills going in the same direction, both through the House and the Senate, getting the governor to sign them? Well, the, the first thing you could say is, is that since when do we see the House and the Senate and the governor work cooperatively on a, on a topic in such a way that in the first quarter, they were the first bills to pass, the first bills to sign in both chambers and on the governor's desk. Uh, I think that that's indicative of us doing really good work. I think it's indicative of the state of Michigan leading the charge towards really the kind of the nationwide sort of review of what we do on criminal justice reform. You know, there's all kinds of thoughts out there as to what we should do on criminal justice reform. We aggregated all of those from juvenile justice to parole, probation, and inside the walls, and really put a comprehensive package together. I'm proud that we were able to do that. Uh, and, I, and I think now is a matter of implementation. Now it's a matter of funding those opportunities. Because every dollar that we save in the Department of Corrections should be plowed back into the kind of criminal justice reforms that help to accelerate the pace of success. If you're accelerating the pace of success, the bottom line benefit is massive GF dollars, general fund dollars that can be used for schools, can be used for roads, can be used for broadband and deployment and development. You name it, that's the flexible dollars as you pointed out in your question earlier. Of course, such a broad ranging set of bills has a big impact, but it impacts the budget too. That's what they're working on now in Lansing. We'll have more about that next. To the point. 
Welcome back to To The Point. We're talking with Senator John Prose from Southwest Michigan, talking about criminal justice reform, yes, but also talking about how it could impact dollars and cents in the budget that they're working on right now. In the segment before, you were talking about flexible dollars or general fund mm -hmm. money. Quickly, I'll give my thumbnail sketch again. You correct me where I'm wrong. About three quarters of the budget, the $56 billion budget that will be kicked out of the House and Senate in the next two or three weeks is already spoken for. It's health and human services and schools. The remainder has a few cut downs, but there is left over between 10, maybe $11 billion in general fund, general uh, purpose revenue for the upcoming fiscal year. That's where things like corrections that we were talking about come from. If you save money there, that money can go to roads. That money can go, as you pointed out, to schools. So we're in that budget process right now. Give me your take, understanding it's a couple of days before this airs and things can yeah. change, but the budget's not going to get done this week. No, no And that's right. so where are we on the budget in a process that has gone from being taking us to, and you were here for some of the faux government shutdowns, to the point where it's been done months early, uh, signed, sealed, and everybody knew what they were going to have by the time October rolled around. I think the most important thing that we do is quality. I think that we have to make sure that we're talking about a quality budget, not just a speedy budget, not just a budget that everybody can send a press release on and say, see, we got it done early. But there are a few toll gates that we need to pass. The first and foremost is that we know that all of our schools start on July 1st, their fiscal year. So we have to make sure that our school districts recognize exactly what their expectations are, exactly what the budget will look like. And we've done that every year in the Snyder administration. The legislature's worked hard to meet those deadlines. Uh, and they're accelerated deadlines without question. Because really, the rest of the budget is an October 1st start. We technically could take this right up to October 1st. I don't think that's the prudent choice. I'm not suggesting it to your point. I slept on the House floor uh, for several nights uh, over several shutdowns. It was unnecessary and it was not good government, it wasn't responsible, and it in fact eroded the confidence that the public has in the legislature when it's already tenuous anyway in, in, in the political environment with which we are today. And by the way, there's no good place to sleep on the House floor, just speaking from uh, experience. No, and in fact, I recall one of my colleagues literally under his desk, a few of us were in the caucus room, it was really an uncomfortable situation. It wasn't pleasant and it wasn't pretty. The good news is, is that we're going to get the budget done early. It's still going to be before our constitutional requirement. Uh, we're going to give school districts the chance to recognize exactly what they can expect so they can build their budgets appropriately and take care of our kids in our classrooms. I I'm not at all worried about that. Really, the debate right now is, is what is going to be the best quality product that we can produce. And certainly the legislature has interest in things like the public school employees retirement system. Uh, we know that there were a lot of priorities that the governor has. There are priorities that the legislature has. So really it's a matter of just figuring out which of those priorities uh, are going to be funded by those very flexible general fund dollars, which is why when we see savings in, in a corrections budget, uh, it is so very important for us to recognize that that can be utilized in ways that give us even more flexibility towards success. What we call for in the Senate budget is reinvestment of many of those dollars into these programs that we talked about in the first segment related to criminal justice reform. If we're able to fund those best practices for, say, parole agents to have flexibility on the ground to manage what's necessary in, say, my Benton Harbor community or my St. Joseph community as opposed to somebody in the Detroit area that has an entirely different need with their parolees. We have transportation challenges in Southwest Michigan. Transportation isn't always the same challenge in some of our larger cities. So that may be a flexible way for us to fund best practices in that particular community. That's where we see these GF dollars, these general fund dollars being the most benefit. Let me see if I understand this in the way I think I do. If this were a household budget, and we were fortunate enough to have $5,000 left over after we thought we had everything else figured out, before we finalize that, we might want to decide what to do with that $5,000. Do we take that and put it into the auto fund? Do we put it into the house fund? Do we put some of it into the vacation fund before we finalize everything else? So the same is true for you. You need to decide with about $500 million, give or take, what to put in the rainy day fund, what to put in the infrastructure, what to put after corrections, where you want that money to go before you finalize the rest of the budget. That's exactly right. And, and it is, it's a matter of prioritization. It's a matter of what is most necessary, uh, followed by what is most needed, followed by what might be really nice to have, followed by this is our dream. And the fact is, is that within all of that, it's a high class problem that we have because there were years that when I was talking to you, Rick, you know full well, we were talking about 
we're 300 to 700 million dollars short. We're a billion dollars short. We really have to tighten our belts in ways that are really, really uncomfortable, just like we've seen our families have to do during the downturn. The Great Recession, really, Michigan took it on the chin. We're in a high-class problem right now where we're seeing prison reductions to the point that we're seeing significant opportunities for saving. We're seeing significant revenue increases, enough for us to see investments in areas like Rainy Day Fund if that's a priority. I mean, already we've gone from, what, a couple, couple million dollars in the Rainy Day Fund to some $670 million in the Rainy Day Fund today. That's, that's fantastic. Maybe now there's some other areas that we can work on long-term benefit long-term benefit that, that gives us the best opportunity to achieve success, which is why I want to reinvest some of the savings in the Department of Corrections in a way that gives us a chance to reinvest in those innovative programs, innovative programs that accelerate the pace of success. So really, spend a couple of dollars here, save even more on the backside there because we're seeing even greater success in fixing the underlying problems of offenders. You are one of the few people I can ask this that has the perspective of serving in the House in some really tough times, serving in the Senate in some considerably better economic times, having the benefit of serving under a Democratic governor, with a Republican governor, with Republicans split in the House and Senate, all of those different. Given where we are today, given the budget process, as you and virtually everybody has said, is going to be done in a relatively short period of time, and given some of the other big things out there, including the employee retirement system, which I think I, my opinion, not yours, I think becomes a larger issue as we, we go forward in this. What is the relationship like comparatively mm -hmm. between the House and the Senate and the Romney building where the governor is over sure. there, uh, given some of the other times you've seen? Cause obviously, it get, when there's more money around, just like it is at home, it's probably a little easier to get along, right? Uh, so that may help. But, but what is it like? To use the analogy of your own family budget at home mm -hmm. and getting along with the, the needs and priorities of the individuals in your family, Imagine that a third of your family turns over every two years to half. Or uh, imagine that, in fact, the priorities of the individuals that were in your family last week, but now your family is different this week, it has been that chaotic in terms of prioritization, in terms of what's necessary. Uh, and then you take the leaders of the different organizations, whether it be speaker, majority leader, or governor, and while in the Senate and the governor's office it's been relatively constant, between two leaders in the Senate during the Snyder administration and Snyder himself as our governor, we've had several speakers, all with different priorities, all with different caucus agendas and ideas. And, and that in and of itself creates some of the difficulty of alignment. And that difficulty of alignment really then comes down to leadership. And that's where I think we've seen some fantastic leaders uh, in both chambers, Republicans and Democrats alike, in fact, that have been able to try to bring some consensus towards that aligned vision, that aligned goals and objectives. And really what you're talking about right now in the budget discussion is where's that alignment? And in some ways it's figuring out who the new neighbor is, or in this case, not even the neighbor, it's your family member using that analogy right across the table. What's their priority? How are we two priorities together? Once you align that, then it's a matter of numbers, it's a matter of language, it's a matter of who gets that they get it signed um, and their names on it, you know, that kind of thing is, is all, all able to be worked out, I think. But um, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it is a chaotic situation in term limits when you have people coming and going like they do and the priorities shift and change without any knowledge or, or, or necessary understanding of where it's coming from and why until everybody figures each other out. Our thanks to Senator Prose, and we'll be back with more to the point. What happens to the budget? What happens to the state employee retirement plan? All of that will be part of the discussion next week on Mackinac Island. And that's where our show will originate as we show you what's going on at the Regional Area Chamber of Commerce meeting. I'll be there and I hope you'll be here next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for To The Point.